Welcome, viewers. We got great news. The Ever Given is free from the Suez Canal. She's underway. I'm going to explain how they got her free and what happens next in this live stream video. But first, please hit the subscribe button and thumbs up the like so you can continue to get amazing maritime content and be ahead of the next instant. Now, I can't help it. I promised my uh, teenage daughter I would not dance in this video, but whoo, it's free. We got her free. Smith got her free. All right. And really quick, I want to let you know that this video is sponsored by Black Sail, B-L-K-S-A-I-L dot A-I, preventing black swans, Black Sail Maritime AI platform makes your operations at sea safer, greener, and disruption free. Black Sea are the guys who are going to prevent the next black swan incident from happening. So, woke up this morning and we found out that they had gotten the stern of the ever given free last night. We had higher high tide and a few things happened. To recap, they brought in dredgers uh, the last couple days and they started dredging around the ship. Let me bring up pictures of the dredger. These are suction dredgers and we had a suction cutter. A suction dredge is a barge with a pipe down that goes into the, the, into the water and just like a big vacuum cleaner sucks up what's down there. But they found a big rock under the bow of the vessel so they brought in this suction cutter suction cutter is the same thing but instead of a fixed pipe that pipe rotates it's got a drill bit around it hole in the middle and as that's turning it's cutting into the rock and sucking out what's there so that was the big thing and then as you guys saw those diggers were digging up the around the vessel so they had made progress last night they had gotten to the point where uh, the rudder was free, and that was a big movement. So I'm going to bring up what that looked like here. Um, here is uh, part of the uh, dredge operation. So we have another photo of what that dredge looked like. So here's the dredge. You can see right here is the... Um, uh, drill bits that go around that pipe and the pipes actually inside extending down under that bow cutting out that rock on the bow and then they had a regular suction cutter on the stern uh, that was that was sucking out the sand around the stern of the vessel so they got a lot of the sand out and the rock out of the vessel and then what they did is they got heavy duty uh 200 to 250 bollard pole tugs these are offshore uh anchor handling tugs these are the big tugs that they use to manhandle big oil rigs into spot and drop those anchors on it so the average tugboat in the Panama, in the Suez Canal, prior to this, those small ones that we saw originally. Sorry, my uh, thing is blocking my view, so I can't see it. Um, let me bring up a picture of the small tugs that we saw originally, if I can find them. All right, here we go. These are the big ones. You can see the small one in the center, and then we got the big ones. The small ones had about... 50 uh, bollard, tons of bollard pull. These large ones that they brought in. Let's get another picture of the larger ones that they brought in. Uh, had 200 to 250 tons of bollard pull. So they waited for higher high tide and they pulled that stern free. That's what happened when I had woken up. Woke up, I did an interview with the Associated Press and talk about what's next and how difficult it was going to be to get the bow. Uh, and then at the end of the interview, the guys called back and said, hey, we got to redo because the ship is free. So I'm going to show you what it looked like um, when I woke up. If I can find that photo here. Here we go. All right, so when I woke up this morning, 
uh, this is what had been done. Look at all of these tugboats that they had around the suction dredge, and they basically tied uh, tugs up to this, uh, we call it a starboard aft quarter. The quarter is the kind of corner of the vessel. They pulled these tugboats uh, up into it. You can see it here. And on one side they pushed, and on this side uh, they pulled, and they were able to get this around and rotate it on the bow. But we still had a problem. Again, they had found out this bow was uh, hard up against the side of the canal. Now, the, the, the port side of the canal, this side, um, is deeper than this side. So actually, it gets shallow right around here. So all of this part up here was the ground, and the bow was sitting on a rock. So that changed the whole dynamics. The stern was free, but the bow was pinned against the rock. So as they twisted it, it was twisting on that bow, right? And we still had to get that bow free. How do you get the bow free? We don't have details, but we have a little bit about what the plan was to get the bow free. And let me find the next picture here. All right, this is, this is really important. This was the critical phase. Once that stern came in, the, the mate, we were out of the woods for the big problem. All right, and here was what the big problem was. This is where we looked yesterday. The big problem was here, that one side was on one side of the canal, one side was stuck on the other, and as this uh, water went down in low tide, we had immense sagging uh, pressure on the hull of the ship and we did an interview with uh nick sloan the the salvage a salvage master to the costa concordia who said as this vessel sinks down in the tide and then comes up it's bending and it's bending down in low tide and holding there and we were the worst case scenario was cracks along the center of the hull that was one problem second as we were across the canal um like this photo you had to get um uh, uh, they were going to bring in land cranes. And look, a land crane would have to reach all the way across to the center to, to start pulling off containers. But we found out uh, that they were able to get uh, cranes in um, the uh, barge cranes. Let's see if we have a picture of the barge crane. Here we go. Moving here. We had the crane. They got up on the uh, this dredger and a crane here. And then once, once it was just the bow we had to worry about, they could start pulling containers off of the bow and either moving them back. All right, so now you have this end on the rock and this end is no longer pinned. So you have most of the weight on the water now, which is great. That water is now, again, holding up the whole bottom of the ship and you're not worried about those cracks in the middle anymore. And then it's just a matter of pumping water and ballast out of the front of the ship and moving it back. Uh, so the, the stern goes down and the bow come pops up a little bit. And then they just pulled the hell out of her, tore her right back out of the side. And now she is moving, uh, she's moving north to the Bitter Lake where she is going to get inspected. So that's what happens next. Now we talked briefly about kind of the... Uh, the multinational effort that's required with anything on board ships. And we published a whole article about, um, with the, with the more famous, uh, U2 star chief Mackay and, uh, his video talks about who is responsible for this ever given incident. And let me bring up his video. Chief Mackay. I could find it here. Hold on one second. So the chief was talking about, you know, that the captain has ultimate responsibility, but obviously doesn't have the deep pockets to pay for this damage. Here is the video with, with uh, the good chief. And this guy's uh, videos are awesome. Go check out his channel, Chief uh, M-A-K-O-I. And uh, in the preface to this video i talk about this is a complicated topic considering the captain is indian the canal pilots are egyptians the owner and shipbuilders are japanese 
The operator is German. The insurance company is British. The charterer is Taiwanese. That's Evergreen. The cargo is Chinese. The salvage company, Smith, is Dutch. The ship is Panamanian flagged. And the all-important classification society is American. So why is the classification society important? And particularly important in this next phase. So when the ship it uh, enters the Suez Canal, as uh, Chief Bakai told us, that we bring on Suez Canal pilots. Now, the Suez Canal pilots are the ones who understand the canal better than anyone. As a ship captain, I was a ship captain, we go from port to port, but we don't understand the local conditions, the local currents. We don't know the, the, the name of the tugboats and the capabilities. So we bring on a pilot, and that pilot actually gives the orders. He's giving the orders to the helmsman. Uh, port uh, left rudder, uh, starboard 10 degrees rudder, um, and, 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 and actually maneuvering the ship. He's the one talking to the tugboats. And then, but as captain, the ultimate responsibility for the safety of your ship and your crew is always in the hands of the captain. So the captain has ultimate responsibility. He's verifying any mistakes. So if the pilot says, uh, uh, Port 10 degrees rudder, and sorry, I always get a little confused because in America we call it left, right, and internationally it's port starboard. But if the pilot says uh, left uh, 10 degrees rudder and the rudder goes right, the officer on watch catches it, but I as captain am standing back and making sure no one messes up and I can take over responsibility. But that's tricky, right? Because as captain, if I take over responsibility, then the pilot could get upset or I can confuse his game plan and you don't really want to mess up the game plan in the middle of it. So 99.9% .9 of the time, the captain does not take the helm from the pilot, but he's always responsible, right? However, the second that ship goes, and the, the, the canal is not responsible. It's the ship owners that's responsible for any damage pollution uh, for paying for it. And the ship owner has what's called P&I insurance. In this case, it was uh, insured by a London-based UK P&I, Protection and Indemnity. And they're the one who's going to pay for any of uh, damage that is done. And there are different types of insurance and cargo insurance and machinery, but that's the most important one for disasters. So the second it grounded and blocked the Suez Canal, the captain is still responsible for the ship and the company is still responsible for all damage but decisions on what to do next are transferred to the suez canal authority so the local coast guard or in this case military organization that is in charge of the local port the suez canal authority in this thing is the one who can say what happens next it makes sense because of pollution in their water the blockage of their canal, they're the ones losing the money. But again, they're not salvage experts. So they get with the UK PI Club, and there is always talk between the local authorities and the PI. Now, the PI Club's the ones that are writing all the checks. They're the ones who select the salvers, they're the ones who select the oil spill containment, and they're the ones who pay for all the tickets and everyone flying in, all the equipment, extra tugboats that have to be hired. They're writing the check. So they are the ones who are, you know, technically in charge. And then they, they don't have the expertise, so they will subcontract with the salvage uh, master. So the salvage master arrives. He's getting paid by the uh, p &I club, uh, but he has to take orders from, and the p &I club's in the interest of the owner, Right. So, and then he's got to, uh, but he's got to take ultimate orders from the uh, canal authority. So in this case, if they, usually they take more time, right? They would start taking off containers to make sure that that ship was not damaged in the salvage or as much as recoverable. But because the Suez Canal authorities are in charge and because the insurance is on the hook for all the, you know, not all, but some of those damages for all the blocked ships, they decided we're just going to yank this damn thing off and to hell with the damage to the bow. Now, before we were worried about a crack in the center because both sides were up and the ship was sagging and, you know, you sag enough and you're going to crack, right? But now once the bow was on and all that pressure and all the, all the, 
all the stress on the metal and all, you still have the fatigue problem, but it was all on the bow as the stern is nice and even on the water. So they rotated this out, they got the weight, they popped it, but they eventually just had to use manpower to drag that thing out. So there are likely cracks in the bulbous bow. We don't know. The whole bulbous bow could have cracked off and sitting there for all we know. We don't know. But there's likely a lot of damage to that bow because they manhandled this thing out. And now she is sailing to the Bitter Lake. And we talked about all of these international entities involved. Uh, the most important, now she's a ship again. She's not a wreck. So now it goes back uh, uh, to the responsibility of the ship owner. And the insurance company obviously is going to have to pay for repairs and monitoring the situation. And the salvers are still on scene. But now we go back to some semblance of she's a ship again instead of a wreck. So captain's back in charge. And we have gotten reports um, uh, from the uh, operator. Let me bring this up. Where is the operator? Sorry, let me bring this down. The operator, which is German, gave us this report on exactly what happened. Uh, Bernard Schultz Ship Management. So the ship owner hires them to hire the crew. The ship manager hires the crew and pays the normal bills, like the canal charges, when things aren't going wrong. Again, when things are going wrong, it's the P&I Club Insurance that are paying the bills. During normal operations, it is the ship management company. So... Now that it's a semblance of a ship, they're going to be a more important element of this moving forward. And they say, as technical managers of the container ship ever given, we can confirm that the vessel with safety refloated at approximately 1,500 local time on 29 March 2021. Woohoo! BSM extends its deepest gratitude to all parties involved in the emergency response, including the Canal Authority, Smith Salvage, and the crew on board. Now they've made... Uh, you know, they've continually praised the crew, and this is great, and we'll talk about that later. But they said, Ever Given is now to head to the Great Bitter Lake while she will undergo a full inspection. So we have, uh, you know, the details you need to know about this press release on gcaptain.com. I'm not going to go further, but they got their ship back. And what's this was really, I know it's been almost a week and it's been horrible, but this is really best case scenario on a number of fronts. One that they, they, you know, right where higher high tide, they were successful. You know, what are the chances of that? And, and people have seen some of my videos, especially with Nick Sloan and said, it's, there's a very low chance that this would work out today. Um, but as gamblers and poker players happen, you know, um, I was reading a book of a famous poker player and he was giving a tournament, you know, talking to the tournament uh, on TV. And he said, well, this player has an 80% chance of winning. This player has a 2% chance. And this player has an 18% chance of winning. And then the guy with a 2% chance of winning won. And everyone, you know, started writing in the TV. And while well, the, the poker experts said that that guy only had a 2% chance, how did he, you're wrong. He was wrong. And he goes, no, this guy was not wrong. The 2% the chance actually wins sometime. So th this was more like a 10% chance that this would w work, and it did work. So we're thrilled. But more importantly, in most of these incidents, the easiest, cheapest and thing is to they blame the captain. Uh, we had the Wakashio in um, Mauritius last year, and there's still oil, and they're still cleaning that up. The ship had altered course two days before it crashed, and it crashed, and the salvage team took days to get there. By the time it got there, the hull, that was the worst case scenario, the hull cracking into oil spilling. And what did they do? The first thing they did was, you know, arrest the captain and the chief mate, uh, even though it, it only was partially his fault. They didn't arrest the salvers for showing up late. They didn't, and the delayed salvage and the lack of oil booms. No, they always were arrest the captain. This happens frequently. But a captain just plays one part in the overall role. Uh, the Atlantic wrote an article with my help about bridge resource management, how we got to extend that to now engine room and a whole vessel resource management. And now you have all these other players, right? The regulator and the inspector and thing. And if they're not working on a team, if they're just blaming the captain, and I'm not taking responsibility away from captain as, as a captain, I would never suggest that, but it's more of a teamwork environment now. So 
they didn't blame the captain. This is great. There was no pollution and no one got hurt. It's no pollution. No one got hurt. And the captain's still in charge of this vessel. And uh, the whole crew learned a lot by this experience. So, I mean, the best case scenario, 10% chance of happening. It happened, guys. This is wonderful. So what happens next? We talked about the all-important um, classification society. Um, so the classification society is in charge of, I'm going to bring them up here. Uh, there, and there are a number of classification societies, but the classification society for the Ever Given is ABS, the American Bureau of Shipping. They're based in Houston. Last I checked, they're the most profitable nonprofit in the world, which gets your eyes a little going. But basically, um, the, the Panamanian flag, she's registered, and they're supposed to inspect everything. And then you have the insurance company that's wants to make sure that the vessel is inspected properly and has all the technical guidance and all the rules they need in place. One second. So um, as we moved from the UK being a flag and the American flag, you know, America was the, had the biggest merchant marine, American flagships, ships with American flags off the back after World War II. Now we're the 22nd largest because all of these ships were registered in Panama and Marshall Islands uh, were reduced tax rates and, uh, you know, basically less rules, less expenses. But these guys basically, you know, collect the check and they set the minimum rules. Um, but they don't have the teams of inspectors and investigators to investigate this. I mean, remember, this is a crime scene, guys. There's a black box on here. And even though I hope the captain doesn't get arrested and it's looking like he's not going to be um, and there's not going to be a criminal trial, there is a civil trial. And this is still you're going to be huge amounts of lawsuits billions of dollars at play over the next years as this goes out. So there's a lot of forensic information. And as it gets towed to the lake, is it seaworthy? Can it continue? So at the lake, uh, best case scenario is they look at all the machinery and they're going to go American Bureau of Shipping inspectors are going to go through every system, every safety system, the engine looking for cracks, looking for problems, looking at the fuel and making sure that whatever caused this does not impede its next transit. In best case scenario, it is allowed to continue to its next port where it was going to go, which is Rotterdam on its own. Probably unlikely to happen. Next best scenario is it can go to Rotterdam, but it has to have a salvage tug alongside in case anything happens. Um, the more likely scenario is it is allowed to go to the next large container port in the Mediterranean where everything's offloaded and then it is going to be brought into dry dock. A dry dock is exactly what it sounds like. It's a dock uh, with two piers. Ship goes in the middle of it, and there's a big door at the end of the pier. Closes, all the water goes out, and then they can get underneath and look for these cracks. We know there was flooding in the bow uh, void space, and we know there was flooding in the bow thruster room. So it's likely that the bow thruster is out, and there are cracks in the bow which were probably widened when they pulled it out. So that's what they are going to do. And ABS is a wonderful organization. They have some of the best inspectors in the world. They are going to inspect it. They're going to make temporary repairs, welding, or whatever is needed to be done to move on. And they're probably going to bring it to a nearby container port discharge and the ship will go to um, a dry dock for major repairs. Now that's what's next for the ship. Uh, what's next for the canal? Um, well, uh, MERS came out uh, before it was free, but after the stern was freed, saying uh, this is going to take, sorry, wrong, it's going to take months to clear this mess. So you remember, a lot of the ships decided to go around Africa, which now looks like a poor move. But again, there was just a, about a 10% chance they were going to free it today. Well, all of these ships are just in time shipping. They're needed for factories and supplies and all that. And, you know, there's still going to be a bottleneck. These ships are going to take, the container ships are faster. Some of them can get to their destination in five days. And they left, some of them left two days ago. Some of the uh, oil tankers are a lot slower. They're going to take weeks to get to their destination, the bulk ships. So this is going, and even when they get there, 
everything in the container shipping world is very exact. They know exactly when the ship's going to leave uh, China. They know exactly when it's going to transit the Suez Canal. They know exactly when it's going to get to its destination, Rotterdam, and they're scheduled. This one arrives at this time, this one at this time, and all the trucks from the different companies are ready to take the containers to the factories. Now the schedule is blown up. All right. Instead of this ship arriving at this time, they're going to have to rearrange all this and re get all the trucks and the intermodal shipping. And there's still a huge logistical mess to figure out. Supplies are still going to be delayed. So that's what Maersk said. Uh, the the but they are able to get ships through the Suez Canal. They have prioritized the livestock carriers. We talk about this. There's a whole uh, uh, G Captain article about uh, the 100,000 of livestock, primarily sheep, that are waiting. Remember, Suez Canal is hot, waiting in this hot environment. So they want to get those livestock carriers for first to minimize. I'm sure animals have already died and, and suffered. Uh, so they want to get those through first. And then uh, after the time critical, equipment and uh is through they are going to go first come first serve so they all basically picked a number when they showed up at the port so that's is sort of what happens next but the bigger issue is uh what 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 are the other repercussions so i wrote an article here and i'm not going to get too deep into it because this is getting to be a long video of we still have not solved the problem. I'm going to bring it up here. Uh, it's called New York's ever given crisis is bigger than Egypt's, but uh, Budacek sits silent. So what hasn't been addressed is these mega ships, 20,000 containers go into a port like Newark or Oakland or Felix Stowe or Rotterdam, and they're dumped on the national highway system and they're brought on trucks the trucks bring those containers to a nearby warehouse where everything's taken out and it's reassembled and then it's brought to like an Amazon warehouse where it's reassembled again. Then it's put on another truck to go to like a UPS or FedEx warehouse and then another truck and brought into downtown Manhattan. Well, 70% of all carbon emissions in the world is from cities, our cities. And 70% of that is from trucks. And most of that is from these mega ships just dumping tens of thousands of containers at a time on our highways and bridges and tolls. What are the two things the Biden administration is worried about most? One is climate change. Two is infrastructure. And three is the health of, of our poorest uh, citizens, right? We have poor communities like Newark and Oakland is usually where these terminals are. And an unbelievable amount. It's globally, I don't have the, the thing for the United States, but globally, there are 1,600 children a day which are dying from asthma and other things from these toxic emissions. And our, our first world nations, uh, our cities, are affected the most. So if Newark's right across from Manhattan, and uh, it's a huge problem. The fatalities, if you know, the mayor of de Blasio in New York is highly controversial mayor, a lot of people don't like him, but he was elected because he said he's going to end truck fatalities. His trucks are running over and killing people. That's how he got elected. They have vision zero in New York City. But again, they are not, no one's talking about that it's these containers that are being put on trucks that are clogging George Washington Bridge, Cross Bronx, and everything else. They're adding enormously to climate change. Um, they're clogging our cities, and it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem that should be solved by the maritime administrator, the head of MARAD. Uh, MARAD is the maritime arm of the Department of Transportation. So you have the director of the FAA, the highway director, the uh, train director, and then in the U.S. DOT, you have the head uh, of MARAD. Last administration was Admiral Busby, and he was brought on very early and hired to empowered. Uh, primarily because of concerns with Trump about China. But prior to that in the Obama administration, they did not fill that office for years. And now in Biden, it looks like Obama 2.0, where that job is just not filled. There's no one sitting in that position. And sources inside Marad tell me they have not made progress on recruiting someone inside of Marad. So can you imagine the director of the FAA not being appointed for years 
people would go nuts. But that happened in the maritime because maritime is not a priority and no one understands the importance of the shipping and the solution. So New York City, Port Authority, and the Trump administration got together and had $60 million prizes for people who solved. How do we get these containers from the big container ships into the city, particularly the, the Hunts Point food market? $60 million prize. And um, then with the changing elections, it's all been dropped and gone nowhere. So the thought is, uh, you know, New York's, New York's here, places like Brooklyn's here. It is 20 miles by road to go across the bridge for a truck from Brooklyn after this mega container ship is dropped off. Across is only two miles. So one-tenth the distance, right? And then ships are 10 times more efficient than trucks. Why? People think it's because of the friction. It's not. It's lifting. Anytime you lift heavy cargo, a foot in the air, it takes a tremendous amount of stress and strain. It's pure physics, guys. So trucks have to go uphill, and every time they go uphill, they are burning a lot of fuel. This is why drones will never work as a distribution system. They're fine for packages and UPS, uh, USB drives, and small parts, expensive parts. But food and water and cement, they have to go. Right now, they're going on trucks. But they could come out of these mega container ships and be put on electric ferries which are 10 times more efficient than trucks, and they go a tenth of the distance in New York. So that's 100 times savings in carbon emissions. That's 100th the amount of toxic emission for the kids with asthma. And there go a lot of the traffic jams. So this is the bigger problem. This is the bigger story that the people who are focused on it are not focused on. And this is the problem. Biden promised Egypt help we're getting the Suez Canal free. We got rid of most of our Navy salvage tugs. I think there are only two or three in a military sea lift command. Uh, Army had a huge fleet of landing craft that, and cranes to move containers. We sold that at auction last year. Um, so we don't really have that salvage capability. What I was hoping Biden would do is get uh, Pete Buttigieg over there to solve this mega ship problem and work on short sea distribution. Instead of dumping 20,000 containers in our cities, not just New York, but Oakland, Felixstowe, all around the world. It's a problem. But these are all cities on water where they can be transferred. And the Europeans are better on this. You have uh, Blue Line Logistics in Belgium, which is doing exactly this, taking the pallets from the warehouses and moving it out. And they have Zulu Associates, which is a, a, a related company uh, run by my friend Antune, which is hoping to bring this into New York. But there's no Elon Musk. There's no Jeff Bezos of the sea. Uh, to, there, there's no venture capital. And a lot of that government money, the $60 million prize, that was really earmarked for large companies. They accepted startups, but a startup doesn't have the, the lawyers and the accountants and the all to apply for these grants. And there's no venture capital money, so it doesn't happen. All right, I'll shut up now. But short seed distribution, that is the big problem that yet has to be solved. And then there's the problem of the shipping industry just doesn't innovate. Again, this ship is 25% longer than the ships were 10 years ago. All right, 25% longer, but in order to carry twice as many containers. So we've gone from a max size of 10,000 TUs up to 20,000 ever given. We actually have up to 23, 24,000 TUs of containers. So we've increased the size by 25%, but the cargo capacity 2x. The more important figure is the dead weight tonnage. How much does this displace? If you put a ship in a bathtub, let's say my mouse is a ship, however much this ship weighs is the amount of water that will come out of the bathtub. So 10,000 TU ships were about 50,000 dead weight tons. These new ones are 200,000 dead weight tons. So they're four times heavier. Again, remember the physics of energy efficiency. Trucks are 10 times less efficient than uh, uh, ships because they have to go up on hill. But tr uh, trucks are still, they are 10 times more efficient than planes. Why? Because planes are going straight up and planes are 10 times more efficient than helicopters because at least the plane can kind of move forward as it's going up and get some airlift where the helicopter is just brute force picking that up. And that's what our drone technology, but all these venture capitalists and everyone else is just focusing on drones and scooters. 
Drones aren't going to solve the problem of the heavy weight, weight stuff that's on these containers, and neither are freaking electric cargo scooters. We need electric cargo ferries to solve it. And as it's gotten bigger, again, four times the weight, the crew size has remained the same. It's even smaller. So two Nimitz craft carriers could fit inside the Ever Given stacked up. Two of our largest supercarriers with 100 feet on either end. It's incredible. People don't understand the size of this vessel. It's absolutely enormous. But that supercarrier, each of them has 5,000 people. That's 10,000 people in those two stacks. This Ever Given has 24, maybe 26 people on board. So they've reduced the uh, crew size by you know, some automation, but they have not improved the electronic navigation. It's still a dumb autopilot running AIS, and those uh, technologies were invented 20 years ago, where companies like uh, Black Swan, our sponsor, BlackSwan.ai, has automated, not full autonomy, we won't get there. They don't want to replace the captain. But just like my Volvo, if I was to fall asleep or have a heart attack, it'll slow down on the highway and pull me to the side. That is completely uh, available. Uh, airplanes, right? It's the airplane on autopilot. Uh, that Airbus is going down on autopilot, but the cam is still there to take control if there's a mistake. This is the technology that the IMO has to approve in London. Uh, if we're going to make have these and we want to prevent the next crash, we got to improve and have these safety features. Uh, it's, it's simple things like when there's a mechanical problem, a lot of the captains are still have to call up to the engine room and ask for help. These black boxes, we still haven't seen the black box on this. If this was an aviation crash, the first thing the press would have been screaming for the black box. No one asked for this black box. We don't know why this crashed yet because we don't have the black box. They can easily pull out the USB drive of the black box, send it to the New York Times and G-Captain, and we could tell, have told you two days ago what happened. But they don't even collect the black boxes on ships. For They collect less than 30% of the black boxes off ships, so we don't even know why a lot of these ships are crashing. So, But again, it's because here we go in the U.S., the Maritime Administration, two months in the Biden Administration, and there's fucking no one from check and it gets me angry and uh, because it ends up getting blamed on the captain and we end up kids with asthma and all these other prompts so that's please and not just marad but the the first world nations the consumers of this good the people you you say other countries but we are we are the americans brits french germans we're the ones using all the crap in here so our administration our maritime administration the fact that they have not even got a candidate is absolutely ridiculous. Pete Budacek, if you're watching, shame on you for not appointing someone. I mean, really, we need to get these standards up. The size have improved, but the technology, the training, BRM, my article in the Atlantic, has not improved in decades. You can't just keep making it bigger without better training the captains, better compensating the captains, giving us the technology, and tying this into an air traffic control system to prevent things like the Mauritius. All right, I'll shut up for my rant now. Uh, hopefully we'll have more, maybe a question and answer period in the, in the future, but we got it free, guys. All right, things are good, and I'm an optimist. Hopefully, Budacek and Biden will get someone in there, and they can also work with the maritime administrations of the countries that consume and bring in all this crap on the ships. All right, this is Captain John Conrad signing off for G-Captain. Thank you so much.